Modern software is complex, important. It often looks after valuable things and is frequently connected to the world in the form of the internet. So it's also exposed and the value that it hosts or represents is at risk. Estimates vary, but a European survey calculated that 90% of organisations have suffered a data breach in the last year. The recent Log4j exploit was present in 8% of all Java packages hosted on Maven Central. That's over 35,000 packages. The security of the systems that we build is a very big deal. So how does security fit into a continuous delivery world? And what does DevSecOps mean anyway? Hi, I'm Dave Farley of Continuous Delivery. Welcome to my channel. And if you haven't been here before, please do hit subscribe. And if you enjoy the content today, hit like as well. I'd like to begin by thanking our sponsors, Harness, Equal Experts, Octopus, Specflow and Linode. Several of our sponsors have been supporting our channel for over a year now. Their support has helped us to stick at it and improve the quality of our videos over time. All of our sponsors were picked because they in some way complement the ideas that we regularly discuss on this channel. Octopus share our belief that software development teams can do a better job when they practice continuous delivery. And they've put their expertise into making the hardest parts of this problem easier with their tools. Specflow help teams to practice behavior-driven development for .NET. Specflow supports the creation of the kinds of executable specifications that I describe in lots of my videos here. But specflow.org also has a great community associated with it and lots of valuable tools and resources. For example, check out their recent Gherkin cheat sheet here. Linode is a new sponsor for us. They provide what is widely reported by their users though to be the best cloud hosting experience out there for developers. Please do check in on all of our sponsors and do thank them for supporting this channel. One of the few regrets that I have about writing my book on continuous delivery, uh, along with Jess Humble, is that we didn't write much or discuss security in it. With the benefit of hindsight, this was a silly omission, at least on my part. During most of the time that we were writing the book, I was working to build a financial exchange. And not just any financial exchange, but an exchange that was also connected to the internet. Security was pretty central to a lot of what we were doing. In this episode, I want to talk about the role of security in continuous delivery. DevSecOps, if you like, although it's not my favourite way to describe it, if I'm honest but it is how most people refer to it these days. I spoke at a conference recently and gave a talk that was called Continuous Security, which is a bit closer to my mind, but actually I really think of this as just an aspect of continuous delivery, but we'll get to that later on. Poor security in our software exposes us to risks that we'd all prefer to avoid. Although security is certainly a big deal, it's often treated as something of an afterthought. The classic way of organising a software project is this. Security where it is thought of at all is kind of squeezed in just before we get to the point of release. This is another of those you shall not pass approaches to organising things that really doesn't work very well. Security as gatekeeping. If you watch my recent video on quality assurance and the avoidance of gatekeeping there, you probably already know my preferred answer to problems like this. We need to move security thinking, design and testing into the development team and include it as part of the development process. This is kind of obvious, but at the same time, it's also not how it's often done. This is another of those things that we attempt to defer to another group of people somewhere. But if you can't inspect quality into a system, you certainly can't inspect security in either. It doesn't work very well to attempt remote control programming either, to dictate it in either requirements or through rigid process. Instead, we need to think of security like any other feature of our system. 
not as an afterthought, not a bolt on once everything else is finished, but something that we need to think about and something that we need to design features to support um, all the way through. One of the reasons that I didn't think to add the chap a chapter on security to our continuous delivery book was because I thought it was pretty clear that what we were really were saying was test everything, which naturally includes testing security. Testing alone, though, isn't enough, but it's a pretty good start. My preferred way to think about continuous delivery is that we work to keep our software in a releasable state all of the time. Whatever the nature of the change, if our pipeline says all is good, we're happy to push the change into production. Our change is releasable. This means our pipeline is definitive for releasability. If our pipeline defines releasability and our software needs to be secure, whatever we may mean by that, then the security of our system is one of the criteria that determines its releasability. That means it's a function of the deployment pipeline. So it can determine whether our software is secure enough for release or not. We can't leave this to some post pipeline group or stage. Depending on the nature of your system, there are a variety of things that may contribute to determining that releasability in the context of security. The first one of those is probably compliance. Regulated industries may impose rules intended to enhance the security of the systems that we produce. How can we stick to the rules but still work quickly and efficiently enough? How do we automate to meet those needs? Then there's auditability and traceability. How do we demonstrate that we're doing the right things? How do we detect if something bad happens and, have, and learn from it? And then there's provenance. How can we tell that all of the software that we depend on is safe too? Testing. How can we be confident that the security features of our system work as we expect them to? How can we check that the routes to common security exploits are closed? And finally, culture. If it's too late to inspect security into our systems, how do we get security thinking built, built into the development process throughout? Let's look at each of these in a little bit more detail. Compliance is often seen as a barrier to continuous delivery, but I think that this is quite a big mistake. In fact, I think this is the opposite of what's true. I don't think that you can be genuinely compliant in the absence of continuous delivery, within the, at least within the kinds of regulatory frameworks that I've seen. You need an effective deployment pipeline to be compliant. I think of compliance as usually aiming to achieve three things. First, is the change safe? Are we confident that our changes do what we think they do and don't break anything that will hurt people physically or financially or damage their privacy in some way? Next, can we demonstrate that we did all that we could to be confident our changes were safe? And then, if something does go wrong, do we have things in place, technology or process, to understand the problem and correct it quickly and safely and maybe learn from whatever it was that went wrong so that we can avoid that kind of problem in future. In continuous delivery, the pipeline is extremely well positioned to help with nearly all of this. We can run tests of all different sorts to determine if our changes look safe. It's almost impossible to imagine building a deployment pipeline that doesn't also give us great automated metadata as a side effect of its construction. Data that describes how our development process worked for every change that, we, that flows toward production. Who came up with the idea in the first place? Who committed against this change? What tests were run? Their results? How the change was rejected if any test failed? Who authorised the release? And so on. All of that really meets the second demand of compliance. Can we de demonstrate our working? And to some extent, part, partly the third. Do we have useful information to learn from when something does go wrong? The pipeline certainly gives us that for failures that we can detect during the development process. Improving our auditability and traceability across the board also helps with this and puts us in a good shape um, to monitor what's going on in production systems by adding traceability there too.
in the form of monitoring, and that kind of completes the picture. Collecting data from production allows us to detect intrusions, analyse them, and maybe even replay real scenarios in test environments so that we can figure out better ways to defend against them. Provenance has been in the news a bit lately. Modern systems are complex and usually depend on a lot of software that comes from somewhere else, somewhere outside of our direct control. Again, a deployment pipeline helps enormously with this. A deployment pipeline operates as the only route for change into production, or at least it should. And that means that we can use it to standardise our build process. There are no alternate routes, no quick builds on a dev workstation. Software is built in one place in a well-defined, well-controlled way. The pipeline regularizes all of this for us. We use the same normalized route for all changes, including changes to dependencies. If we want to upgrade to the latest version of our language or our operating system, we commit a change to the pipeline and the system is built and tested. If we want to update our cool open source framework or make a change to our application, we commit a change to the pipeline and the system is built and tested. All changes that may end up in production, whatever their nature, trigger the build and run all of the tests. Organising things this way, as well as giving us a place where we can check everything on, the way, on its way to production, the pipeline, also gives us another big advantage we can be definitive about which version of everything defines a release. We will release the versions of everything that we've just tested. It's important when constructing a deployment pipeline where security is an issue, and remember that is most of software, to control the addition of dependencies. We can't allow any backdoor routes to change our system, so we need to be very careful about how we deal with things like public software repositories. You certainly need to test any updates or additions before allowing them into production, so we must control the versions of dependencies that we will allow in in some way. This is quite a big job if you decide to do all of this for yourself. Are you going to monitor the risks and flaws associated with all third-party software that you use? Uh, if you do need to take security ser seriously, then either you do that or you delegate that part of the job to somebody else. These days there are a few managed repository services around where the companies that run them for a fee will guarantee that they have checked the provenance the in and integrity of any software that they store and make available to you. These locked down repositories offer increased confidence that third party code has been checked. Testing, and particularly very thorough automated testing, is a central plank of continuous delivery. This is a big help in keeping our systems more secure. It makes it easy to evaluate changes of all kinds, including updates to our dependencies and infrastructure. So we can update those dependencies more often and with greater confidence. The data says that if your infrastructure is out of date by more than eight months, you are exposing yourself to security risks, the kind of exploits that hackers know about. That exposure goes up by about 95%. So if you want to make the hacker's life more difficult, update your infrastructure regularly. Yet again, a good deployment pipeline is the best tool to give you a fast, efficient route to making such changes with confidence. There are lots of other places where tests can help too. When we built our financial exchange at LMAX, we ran batteries of security-related tests throughout our pipeline. Unit testing security features in the commit stage, but also running static analysis designed to fail if they spotted a potential security risk. We had an interesting form of test that we wrote and ran in our commit stage too, that attempted to do SQL injection attacks on all UI components of our system. We isolated the UI code, scanned for any input field automatically, we faked the back end and then ran our tests. In the tests, we captured the data that made it through the web tier into the back end and then scanned these outputs from the UI code to see if any SQL had leaked through. If it did, we failed the build. 
We had an acceptance test too that tested any security related feature that we developed. We had tests for authentication and access control, and we had tests that ran any automated penetration tests that we could think of too. All of these ran on every commit as part of our deployment pipeline. If any test failed, the change was rejected and wouldn't make it into production. Finally, there was monitoring in production. There are ways in which I think it useful to think of these sorts of this sort of monitoring as a kind of test too. As well as monitoring just to capture streams of data, think about how to interpret test that stream to detect intrusions. Think like an attacker. Imagine how you would try to compromise your own system. This is one version of something that security professionals called threat modeling. Now think of how you could detect such an attack and write code to do it. Provide mechanisms to signal the attack. And since these are features like any other, write some acceptance tests for them too. These tests should simulate the attack to show that your code detected it. There are a lot of different kinds of testing that are relevant to doing a good job on security. And what you pick will depend on the risks that you want to defend yourselves against. The last item on the things that I think about when it comes to security is culture. And primarily, it's about the relationships involved in trying to solve this problem between security professionals and everybody else involved with the development process. Rather like the bad approaches to quality assurance that I spoke about in this video, the traditional way of positioning security in a dev process is to add them as some form of gatekeeper, staunching the flow of risky changes into production, just as with QA. This approach doesn't really work. However expert the people are, security people reviewing things after the fact is too late to change the facts. If we want our systems to be secure, we need to build them to be secure. So we need to get that thinking up front into the production process. This is really a pretty general principle for me. The reality of software production is that it doesn't work like a production line if we want our software to exhibit some desirable property, whatever that is, high quality, fast performance, massive scalability, or to be secure, we need to think about these problems and design them into our solutions. You can't sprinkle magic security dust over a pre-existing system and expect good results. So tough as it may seem, dev teams need to think about and take responsibility for all of these things at some level. Naturally, we don't expect every developer to be a deep security expert, but we do need them to think about the security of the systems that they construct. Enough so that they can tackle the commonest problems and biggest risks and manage those common risks, but also be thoughtful enough and knowledgeable enough to realize those points when we are straying beyond our understanding. And, and then we can call for help from an expert, in this case, a security expert. The security expert's role then is to advise and coach the team before work starts, not to gatekeep afterwards. Starting a new project, I'd recommend holding some learning sessions with the security expert explaining the basis of their field to developers so that the developer team has a basic understanding of the risks and the mitigations. Think about ways to use automated testing to encode some of this exp expertise, a bit like my SQL, SQL injection testing example. Then, at every opportunity, every time the security expert is asked for their help on a team, their job then is not to just take the work away from the team, but to help the team do the work and to coach them and grow their security knowledge and understanding in the context of the problem that they're working on right now. This isn't all there is to improving the security of a system that we can build, of course. We need to architect our systems to be robust too, to keep secrets, to limit authorization and access to valuable resources and lots of other things. But I think that this is a pretty good start, at least in the context of continuous delivery. Thank you very much for watching.